Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second panel session of the day. The title of this panel is AI and Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. In this panel, we're going to cover questions like what is the relationship between AI and diversity, equity, and inclusion? And perhaps more importantly, what should it be? Uh, it's been known for years that the tech industry has been plagued with a lack of diversity, which has led to numerous major problems, not only for the workforce and companies themselves, but also for the products and society at large. So this panel will consider both the problem and potential solutions. I'd like to offer special thanks to our, uh, Arena Raitu uh, for organizing this panel on such an important and timely topic. Unfortunately, Arena wasn't able to be here with us today, but I know she's watching uh, on, on Zoom virtually with the rest of our participants, and she's very much looking forward to the discussion. I'll be your moderator for today's panel. My name is Susan Kennedy, and I'm an assistant professor of philosophy here at Santa Clara University. Before I introduce our fantastic panel participants, I'd first like to quickly cover some logistics. Uh, so this uh, panel is scheduled to run for an hour and 15 minutes. We'll reserve time at the end to answer questions from the audience. There are going to be cards on the chairs and tables for you to write down your questions, and Monica will come around and collect those. If you're joining us on Zoom, don't worry. You can also get in on the action. Uh, Joel is moderating the Zoom chat, so just drop your questions in the Q&A, and we'll do our best to incorporate them into the conversation. So now on to the people that you're here to see. Uh, by a quick round of introductions, we have Marion Bulko, who is a distinguished postdoctoral scholar in ethics and technology at MIT. She takes an intersectional feminist approach to examining how social variables such as race and gender and sexuality are operationalized within AI systems. Matthew Kwan Johnson is a research fellow in the Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Oxford. He explores the surprising ways in which empathy can hinder efforts to make AI more inclusive. And he's developing an account of the burning virtues that facilitate DEI priorities and involve a significant cost to the bear. Can't wait to hear more about this. Uh, we have Dr. Tina M. Park, who's the head of inclusive research and design at the Partnership on AI. She focuses on working with impacted communities on equity-driven research frameworks and methodologies to support the responsible development of AI and machine learning through greater engagement of impacted communities. Building on PAI's Methods for Inclusion project, this initiative aims to research, design, and pilot inclusive practices developed in collaboration with community-based, academic, policy, and corporate partners. And lastly, we have a dear colleague, Dr. Eric Ramirez, who's an associate professor of philosophy at Santa Clara University. He's interested in all things moral psychology, including moral judgment, sentimentalism, emotion, and psychopathology. And his current research centers on the ethics of virtual reality. He's especially interested in the use of VR for experiments, empathy enhancement, and behavioral modification. And he's developing virtual reality modules of classic thought experiments. He's the author of The Ethics of Virtual and Augmented Reality, Building Worlds, which was published last year in 2021. So welcome to all of our fantastic panelists. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your time. Um, to get things started with the questions, I first have a question for you, Tina. Um, what is the current state of diversity and equity and inclusion in AI development and deployment within the industry context? Uh, so if you could start us off by discussing the partnership on AI's research and talking a bit about why DAI is important in this particular industry context. Thanks so much, and thank you, Susan, for moderating and stepping in. Um, and hi, Arena. <laughs> thank you for the invitation. Um, so as mentioned, I'm with the Partnership on AI. We are a nonprofit organization based here in San Francisco, um, and we have a multi-stakeholder model, which means that we try to bring together corporate, uh, nonprofit, research groups, um, academic uh, and academic researchers, and also um, civil society advocates to come and think about some of the biggest issues that are surround AI ethics. Um, in the hopes that having so many different points of view will come up with the most practical and, um, and implementable solutions to some of these questions of, um, as technology continues to really evolve. Um, so for us, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion has been a really core focus in terms of thinking about both you know, who's sitting on the teams, who's building the technology. Um, so we recently wrapped up a project on um, looking at the factors of attrition for some of our minoritized workers um, who sit on AI teams, um, whether they're engineers or UX researchers um, or in other support roles for those teams. Um, but we also think about it in terms of how we can 
make sure that technology is actually supporting um, diverse communities. Uh, we are a global organization, and so we really think about how do we um, break past uh, who we work with outside of the US, North America, and Western Europe, which tends to be you know, the loudest voices in this sphere right now, uh, to make sure um, voices, particularly from the global majority in the South, um, have a chance to also uh, contribute their learning and insights. Um, and we really want to think about it in terms of how is the technology being built? Um, can we make sure that we're actually moving towards greater social equity rather than less? <laughs> Um, and what are the different practices we have to bring into that space? And so that's where my uh, work tends to focus. So I like to say that we look at both sides of the point of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and so primarily my work is looking at um, how do we do that in the agent process? We know from other fields like civic governance, from public policy spaces, from education spaces where they do a lot of participatory action research, it's actually really hard to get folks involved in the process. Um, and so I think the big question is, is what do we need to change from our standpoint, whether as researchers that sit even in nonprofit or academic spaces um, or in corporate spaces, to make sure that we're building the kind of trustworthy and long-standing relationships with communities that have been really harmed in the past by some of these types of engagements um, to be part of that process. And so um, right now, I feel like the diversity, equity, and inclusion are really hot topics in this space. I, extremely thrilled to see that so many companies especially are talking about it they're coming up with their plans they're actually hiring staff to lead these discussions and they are thinking about it in this sort of more holistic manner of you know they're working with their HR teams to make sure that the, that the people that they're hiring come from a diversity of backgrounds they're making sure that things like um, you know employee resource groups are being well funded and supported because those are the places where we see folks um, really get the support that they need to stay in these difficult jobs and you know sometimes difficult uh, workplaces um, but we're also seeing more ethics teams being built in to support the projects that are happening across the board and they're coming from a, like they're coming from a lot of different multidisciplinary spaces which is also what I like to see um, I personally am a sociologist and we study it from a very macro level right we think about what is the social impact going to be we have um, a lot of the expertise in terms of uh, social inequality and structural um, harms. Um, and so um, I think the industry is moving in a really great direction. I think um, academia has done a great job of highlighting some of these projects and showing that it's possible to actually work with non-technical audiences to build really interesting technical solutions. Um, and so that, those partnerships, I think, are really helping us continue to move forward. And, um, I would just say we need to keep applying the pressure to make sure that this stays a priority for companies um, and we don't sort of slip backwards again um, after some of the traction that we've made. Thank you, Tina. I think one thing that really resonated with what you were saying is it seems like your work is really focused on sort of sustainable change in this space, right? Looking at attrition about who's on the teams, trying to build, as you said, long-standing relationships, not just trying to get people incorporated right now, but trying to make sure that that's something that continues to happen in the future, and that sounds really fantastic. Um, I'll quickly like to hear from Matthew and Mary about your research as well before we can kind of go back and forth with our questions. Uh, so my next question is both for you, Marion, and Matthew. Can you each describe briefly the focus of your work uh, in this area? So Matthew, if you want to get us started. Yeah, yeah. happy to. Um, so uh, I guess when, when I do DEI work with uh, tech companies, I, my thesis statement to them is kind of two points you have to keep in mind. The first is that you can't have a, fall in the trap of having an over-reliance on quantitative data in DEI work. And the second is you, you can't have an over-reliance on the, this kind of mythic power of empathy. And I, I know Eric's going to talk much more eloquently about that. So I'll, I'll kind of bracket that, but have a few remarks um, on that. And so I usually start with how I think this was really powerfully uh, modeled to me in some of my uh, DEI work uh, that I did at the University of Cambridge's uh, philosophy department. And it's because I think there's interesting parallels between the culture and academic philosophy and in the technology sector, and I think we found the similar traps. Incidentally, I will say, um, as, as Tina was mentioning, I think the tech sector has made a lot of progress, so there are some different issues, and if you've been following things like the free speech race pseudoscience issue among philosophers at Oxford and Cambridge, you'll see that there's ways in which academic philosophy is <laughs> very far behind. And I've actually never served on a, a committee in these six years with another person of color, and I'm only half a person of color, I guess, so that's <laughs> interesting. Anyway, so um, in, into the actual content. Um, 
it, it was kind of, as you can see, like a, a moment when we were really in the trenches. And um, uh, basically what happened was we had some leading figures in feminist philosophy and the movement for equity, uh, uh, gender equity and philosophy. And then we had a number of leading figures in whatever the opposite of that movement is. And I got kind of caught in the middle because they said, well, let's just get the data and let the data decide. And Matthew, you have some background in quantitative data science. You know, you just run these studies on our students and tell us what the data says. Unsurprisingly, you know, we had huge statistical significance, uh, moderate to very large effect sizes across a bunch of different measures that showed it was terrible to be a woman. Uh, in, in uh, philosophy and uh, not such a good experience in the department compared to men. And if, uh, we did a number of targeted interventions uh, that interestingly either most of them didn't work or they backfired in some interesting ways. And I think what it showed was that if you kind of just look at the quantitative data, it's very good at answering the questions you're asking. It's not so good at answering the questions you're not asking or you haven't thought to ask, right? So, so just as an example, um, one of the things we asked is like, are you interested in pursuing philosophy past the undergraduate level? And uh, women disproportionately were not interested. So you know, we did some interventions and we fixed that. If we had stopped there, we could have said, wow, we fixed the problem. You know, Gender equity, this is great. However, uh, somebody, I forget who, had the foresight to actually track whether or not people were taking steps to pursue a career in philosophy. And we hadn't fixed that issue, right? So that's the kind of thing where if we had just stopped with the first question, we would have been able to say we fixed the problem. And um, the ways in which some of the other things backfired were because we were kind of over-indexing on the quantitative stuff. And a lot of that was my fault because I, my background was in quantitative data science. And so I'll, I'll, uh, I think how it fits into the empathy piece is that when we were developing the interventions, we had a lot of really well-intentioned people, but we were developing the interventions that they would have found helpful, right? And sometimes you think just because you share a protected characteristic with a certain group, uh, you have an insight into what's going to be effective to them, right? But the problem is we all have very different experiences. Intersectionality also reveals that how our different protected characteristics combine mean that what's going to work for one person isn't necessarily going to work for other people. I think that's why the interventions didn't work, and I know Eric's going to talk a lot more about that. So the last thing I'll leave us with is just, I think the Bible for us should be Catherine D'Ignazio and Lauren Klein's book, Data Feminism. Because they basically say, look, data has historically been used to paper over and misrepresent and lead to all kinds of uh, inequities, right? And work against DEI work. But it also has to be the solution, right? There are ways in which you can use quantitative data really powerfully, but you also have to use these other methods, these kind of qualitative approaches like T Tina was talking about, so you can actually figure out the answers to questions you're not asking or haven't thought to ask, right? And so they're saying you need to know the uses and the limits of quantitative data, but it has to be informed by direct, lived, concrete experience and a commitment to action. And that's what data feminism is, and I think, I think that should be our, our Bible, uh, this, this book. Yeah. <laughs> that is a great book recommendation, Matthew. Uh, Marion, if I could ask you the same, just you know, briefly describe the sort of focus of your work in this area. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you both, Tina and uh, Matthew. That was really interesting. So, can can folks hear me? Okay. All right. Great. Um, yeah. So, my name is Marion Luco. Um, I can just tell you a little bit about my background, and then my research area actually, in some ways, I think connects. Um, really interestingly what Matthew was talking about with this interesting quantitative data. But, um, but yeah, so my background, I'm a philosopher. Um, I was trained um, in my master's degree in kind of a, his a history and philosophy of science and technology. So kind of try and combine historical approaches with um, conceptual philosophical approaches. And then I completed my PhD at um, MIT in the philosophy department. But I was also still really interested in interdisciplinary work and my PhD project was focused on kind of taking some of the, the data feminism work, um, taking a kind of feminist approach to thinking about the ways that social values and norms and kind of cultural concepts get built into the technologies that, um, that structure our lives. And in particular, when we say that, which I'm sure many, many people here have kind of thought about this, when we say, for example, that um, technologies are value-laden or they are kind of uh, 
optical kind of dimensions and components, one of the questions I was interested in is what are the mechanisms by which that takes place? Where, how do the values get built into our technologies? And if, if by understanding that, how can we then assess these technologies and maybe kind of build, move towards a world in, in which we're building technologies with values that we can kind of ascribe to and commit to? Um, so that's kind of the background. Um, with respect to um, the work on to, to the you know today's panel on DEI, it's like really exciting and encouraging to hear from Tina the kind of work that's happening in industry and also from Matthew, like within our own kind of academic fields and philosophy departments. I think that the dimension of my research that I think speaks most closely to this is when I think um, about diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think I've learned from kind of many scholars, including. Um, the data feminist scholars and others, that I think what really, really matters is paying attention, attention to structure and context. And so what I mean by that is there's a kind of simplistic definition, I think, of what it means to have diversity, equity, and inclusion. I don't think it's one that really, probably in this group, is one that, pe that people would probably um, think of, but maybe I think it is at work in other areas, um, which is that, well, it's just a function of the who is that of the individuals and the individual faces that there? Do we have representation across some set of diverse groups? Now that, by all means, is absolutely crucial. Like we need to have, for all of the reasons that we discussed today, it's crucial as a matter of social justice. It's crucial as a matter for making technology, making products that is better for the world. It's a it's a win win situation to have to think about diversity inclusion in terms of like. The people at the table within the companies. But I think that it's a trap if we think that it's only about representation. And I think thinking about the kinds of kind of norms and structures that we have in place um, to kind of facilitate of what counts, for example, as kind of success or good work, and how do these kind of norms of success end up structuring the workplace and our kind of social world such that even if we have those certain individuals at the table, it makes them really, it makes diversity and um, kind of an equitable workplace kind of, um, makes thriving kind of difficult. And so I think it's really crucial to see it as beyond just kind of the individuals at the table. Um, and I think also with context, I think paying attention, not just to kind of philosophical questions, but also to kind of historical and sociological context is kind of crucial if you're going to create a more kind of equitable workplace. And I have one example that I give, maybe a concrete example, is um, some of my work looks at um, data collection within uh, the development of biomedical technologies. And um, it's been kind of, there's a long history of inequities in kind of medicine, the biological world. And this was, picked, and one of the kind of dimensions of one of these inequities or one of the outputs was, um, it, was it was observed by many that there had been a failure to include diverse um, populations within biological kind of clinical trials, for example. And so many of you might have heard of this, like for instance, when we're developing kind of, um, kind of new drugs or any kind of clinical trial, if you only include data about the kind of the, the species norm, which is you know, a white 70 kilogram male, then the products and or the technologies or the drugs that result are then um, kind of designed in such a way that we know that they're safe and effective for this group. And my, one of the famous examples here is um, work on like Ambien. Like there's an, they, there was a evidence or there was an argument made that it turns out, for example, that um, what we know about the safety of Ambien um, is, is, and the safety of Ambien and the right kind of dose um, is kind of specified only for a particular white male. And so this is a problem, right? This is a problem of justice, of representation. And so what we need to do is to include more women and kind of diverse populations within that group. And so the NIH, uh, the National Institutes of Health, kind of put out a mandate that was kind of, um, you know, um, spearheaded and endorsed by these kind of women's health groups and by kind of lots of, you know, people interested in diversity and inclusion, and it all sounds great, right? Like, it seems extremely important to include diverse samples. Um, but this is, things get complicated, and I think this is one of the lessons that I, I like to bring to, to when I think about DEI, is it's not quite as simple as it appears, and you can see that when you pay attention to the context. So what has kind of 
one of the um, results of this kind of, um, it's called the sex as a biological variable mandate. In order to get funding from the NIH, you have to make sure that you include sex as a biological variable in your research and that you use data from diverse populations in this, in this, in this case, both um, females and males, for human and other non-human studies as well. Um, so one of the results of this sex as a biological variable mandate, uh, I've argued in my research and my research with colleagues at um, a group I'm part of called the Harvard Gender Sci Lab, is that what it ends up doing in some cases, it ends up reinforcing this idea that um, uh, sex is a kind of innate fundamental difference that drives, um, that, drives um, that explains and drives kind of different outcomes with kind of um, pharmaceutical products or technologies or others, and it's the case of Ambien, it turns out um, that there's strong evidence that, in fact, it's weight rather than sex that is a better explanation of some of the differences. And so, um, first of all, it help, we end up missing out on that information, um, and this is a result of a kind of tendency we might have to, to see the world in terms of kind of sex and gender as being these like innate biological differences that are kind of explanatory forces. And that's because we structure our world so much by sex and gender. And that's a kind of a, an example of how, in trying to, in to work towards diversity, equity, inclusion, our I, kind of social cultural ideas um, that place such you know, significance on um, notions of sex and gender end up influencing the way our technology gets developed and ends up, in some ways, working against the goal. Um, so, so yeah, so that's why I think, I think that this topic is, I mean, yeah, the questions of diversity, equity, inclusion are absolutely, just like to use Susan Kennedy's words, like timely and essential. And I think that that one of the challenges, the kind of crucial challenges that we're facing is how to think about this in a way that brings in interdisciplinary perspectives, that plays attention to context, and that realizes that DEI is more than just a representation in the numbers game, and it's something that is... Um, is much, <laughs> much more structural and complex. And but I think it's something that with these kinds of groups and these kinds of um, kind of uh, opportunities like site and kind of collaborations and that, that we can kind of it's a challenge that we can meet. Um, but it's yeah. So uh, I think we'll stop that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mary. I think both you and Matthew highlight so nicely how tricky we can get when we start working on solutions mm -hmm. and maybe you see some benefits or positives actually work out well. And then, oop, but actually it's a double-edged sword. And I think this might be a nice transition so that we can round out the introductions of our, our panelist research uh, to ask a question to Eric, who's on our, our Zoom call. Uh, so one way in which organizations have been attempting to address or respond to this sort of lack of diversity in AI is to use virtual reality experiences in hopes of helping users understand and empathize with the experience of other people who are different from themselves in various ways. So for instance, you could imagine an organization creating a VR experience of homelessness, hoping that you'll maybe uh, build some empathy for housing uh, initiatives. So Eric, you've written about this topic rather extensively. Uh, could you describe this practice and your thoughts on it? Yeah, I'm happy to do it. I wanna just first do a quick check that my audio is okay on your end. Sounds great. Perfect, thank you. Um, and, you know, although what I'm going to say is, I think, critical of some of these uses of technology, I, 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 it's, it's, it would be impossible not to note that technology can be used for inclusion, my participation in this panel notwithstanding, right, it's an example of it. Um, but uh, I, I also get, I think, the, the, the benefit of, of having this technology to borrow some, the, the visual medium. Uh, and, and I think, um, you know, this, there's this really interesting and important aspect of equity and inclusion specifically that we're seeing in uh, some of these kinds of spaces that you'll hear me kind of echo some of the things our panelists have already said about structure being important as well. But it really does originate in what I think is, is, is some neat research, right? So this is just a quick still from a, a, a now ancient 2016 study um, by uh, Sun Juan and her colleagues. And, and I, I want to say something about it just to frame why I'm interested in, in, in this kind of question. This was a study that she, uh, that, that where she was uh, having her subjects kind of embody in virtual reality uh, a short horn cattle, right? And, and, and the purpose of this kind of study was to see whether embodying a different kind of being, 
would have effects on things like meat consumption, right? Just uh, will people who have had the experience of being a cow for a while uh, change their behavior? And at least according to you know the the sort of medium term results of her study, it really did. People ate less meat for for a while after they felt like they had the experience of of embodying this kind of creature, and from this kind of inference, right? You started seeing the development of what I think are very interesting, but but I think um, potentially misguided forms of uh, virtual reality simulations, like for example, a uh, simulation named Autismity, which is supposed to help users better understand uh, certain kinds of experiences associated with some forms of autism sensory overstimulation. Uh, there's a, a simulation out there that's meant to give you the experience of being embodied in a pregnant body. Uh, and I think more, more connected to, to, to our concerns are simulations that are aiming to get people to have better understand, empathize um, with the experiences of marginalized peoples by embodying them, right? So bottom left is uh, I am a man. It's a simulation where you embody uh, a black man in the civil rights era. Simulation very bottom center is uh, uh, Carne Arena, which is a simulation of uh, immigrating into the United States, so und undocumented immigration experience. Bottom right is uh, Thousand Cut Journey, which is an experience that's meant to give you uh, the experience of uh, like different well, racist micro and macro aggression, right? And what these simulations have in common, I think, is the serious purpose of aiming to change behavior or aiming to address some of the issues with racism, sexism, ableism uh, by changing the individual on the assumption that you're getting access to a certain kind of experience, right? I'm, I'm not gonna read these particular quotes, but I, I, I want you to see them because these are by the developers of these kinds of simulations. And, and the intuition here, right, is that the, the major issues with things like uh, problems with equity, problems with inclusion is a lack of understanding, right? And that these simulations can then give you that understanding and change you in some way, much as uh, Sun Juan's colleagues, uh, Sun Juan subjects, excuse me, uh, change their behavior after feeling like they had the experience of, of, of being a cow for a while. And um, I think maybe this is this is not a not unfriendly message to to from the panelist point of view. But one thing that I've argued anyway, and this is just a, a this is a paper that I wrote not too long ago with well, a former student now because they graduated. Uh, is that at least from a certain kind of perspective on what it means to have experience, right? Uh, VR can't do this kind of stuff, right? This is the wrong kind of solution to questions about equity and inclusion because what it means to experience something isn't just to have a kind of a neutral camera record an event, right? If you just think about the difference between how I might view a speech uh, given by Donald Trump versus how Donald Trump might view the exact same speech, same exact stimulus, same exact content, but experienced quite differently. Part of what we're drawing from here and, and intersectionality is, you know, it's, it's complicated. There are different kinds of intersectional analyses and, and so on, but but our, our, our criticism of this kind of technology is that what it means for me to experience something is going to be informed by a lot of things having to do with who I am and the kinds of ways in which I understand myself. And what I like about the panel, and, and thank you, Susan, thank you, Arena, uh, for organizing, is, is it is really a an interdisciplinary question, right? So I think um, you, you could have called this lots of different things. If you're a psych neuro person, you could have called it a problem about top-down perception, right? Top-down effects on perception uh, at being a problem for this kind of technology. If you're uh, more oriented in certain kinds of philosophical traditions, it's a phenomenological dilemma, right? It's just about experience and how we understand what it is that experiences are. And so for us, this attempt to use technology to solve, or at least not solve, but address questions about um, equity, questions about inclusion by changing the individual is the wrong kind of approach. And, and as some of the people on this panel have already argued, right? One mistake is just to think that you can transfer experiences this way. We think that's just false. Um, but but this, the second mistake is also that this is addressing a, an importantly structural problem as an individual problem, right? That it's a, it, it's changing individual beliefs, individual behavior 
as a solution to uh, problems with equity and inclusion and diversity, which are structural issues, right? So it's it's attacking the problem in the wrong way, and it's also um, trying to solve it in a, in in the wrong way, or at least a way that's not going to be as helpful as maybe other more long term structural changes would be helpful. And um, I'm happy to say much more about any of these things. There are a lot of these kinds of simulations for all sorts of experience types. Um, and, and Susan, you mentioned one about homelessness, right? That's the, the, the Stanford one. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it's it's not that technology is is, is not something we should be aiming at as, as a tool to help us with uh, diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. But this is not the right approach, is at least how we wanna, how we wanna frame this. And, um, uh, you know, we can talk more about what, what might be other good ways of using this technology, but I think this is definitely not, um, it's it's not the right way of addressing issues with, with uh, inclusion. Can I jump in real quick? Absolutely. Um, so thank you so much for that, Eric, um, and for um, both of you just bringing this pain. <laughs> but one thing I wanted to just segue into is that um, sort of emphasizing your point around empathy isn't quite enough and isn't gonna get us there. There was a fantastic recent piece in the New York Times about, um, really well-intentioned developers who wanted to create um, overlays for websites using algorithmically driven technology for the visually impaired, helped make it easier for them to access visual websites. It wasn't enough to be empathetic, it wasn't enough to even like center the experiences of those with visual impairment on their, like as an ethos for their team, because at the end of the day, we didn't actually work with those communities to build the technology and make sure that it actually works in the way that it's supposed to. And what the New York Times article revealed was that, in fact, it actually made websites harder to access for those with visual impairment using other tools trying to access the internet. Um, and so I think that's a really good way to think about like building for tends not to work because our empathy and our understanding about the complexity of those situations and experiences can only go so far. Um, just as you were saying, Eric, right? Like there's a limit to that understanding. Um, but when you build with and you bring them into the process, you get to identify some of those really low-hanging fruits that you kind of just want to maybe solve for um, a lot more easily. And, and I think the, the desire isn't quite enough to get us there. Um, we, have to, we actually have to really fundamentally change how we build our teams, um, how we engage folks, um, and how we even think about what problems to solve. Uh, and I think if you haven't read that piece, please do. It's a, it's a really good reminder uh, for all of us, I think, who are in this space because we want the technology to be um, beneficial to people. Mary? Yeah, another, that was, this actually, Tina, you know, that made me think also about what you're saying at the beginning where it's like, to, to many it seems like straight forward, like we need to have the communities in, like if we're gonna build technology, and we need to have like the end the end users, diverse end users kind of involved, engaged, maybe even ideally working at the company, but if not, and like I think it was absolutely right what you said at the beginning about how there are like real challenges to making that happen. Um, and maybe even the very first challenges is that some companies don't even think that, you know, they still have the building for, but if you have the building with, um, there's still still lots of challenges. And I'm trying to think, I have one example of in a team, I worked with a group. Um, it was a National Science Foundation funded um, project based at the University of Washington in Seattle um, called the Center for Neurotechnology. And they were building kind of brain computer interface devices that were intended to help those um, with certain conditions, including um, uh, spinal cord problems or locked in syndrome, kind of, or you know, the use of a prosthetic limb. It was going to kind of read off certain kind of patterns, electrical activity, and then allow control of you know, that object. And so, um, there's often a move, and I think this gets to the point about why this is hard, I think that there's a kind of like excitement and funding about kind of funding projects that aim at like, for example, like exoskeletons. I'm not sure if any of you have seen these, but they like enable people to kind of walk and move. And, and there's a reason I think that, that like in many cases, good intentions, like this is where the funding at, this is where media attention is gonna be. But when we had, um, the, what's great about the Center for Neurotechnology is that there's a very well, 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 for philosophy funded group of kind of interdisciplinary philosophers who are embedded within the project. And so we work alongside the scientists and engineers, and we have this kind of end user round table where we bring in kind of intended end users, and, um, and also research has been done on this as well. And it turns out that for many, not all, but for many of these folks, there are other priorities, <coughs> technological priorities, like for example, bladder control that rank kind of, that are kind of everyday prosaic, maybe not as kind of fancy and like 
you know, likely to be in the New York Times or something, but are like, for many, they're like, this would, this is a priority for me. And you just, you don't really think about that when you're thinking about someone, you know, who's, you know, the excitement of an exoskeleton. But it's hard because members of these community, the end users, it's like, they have, you know, their own lives and constraints and just asking them to come in and just kind of be like kind of free labor for the project. So it's like, how do we build, how do we include the end users as like members of like as true members of the team in a way while acknowledging that there are disparities and like epistemic disparities and, you know, prestige and elite, you know, in some cases, like the members of the scientific team are, are not in, you know, the same as, as the end users in all cases. And, and it's, abs it's absolutely a challenge and I would love to hear about how it's being addressed in um, and also, like, how do you do it in a way that's not just like again representation? Like the focus is on representation, right? Or even to, like, and how do we make sure we don't lean towards tokenizing? Yes, there are so um, many. Like, if anything, it's like the complexity, <laughs> the complexity of it all, um, of like really robust, robustly meeting the aims of social. Which I think I often think like social justice is the term I prefer to use than diversity, equity, inclusion because I feel like it's broader and kind of speaks to and points to. Um, kind of how kind of structural and contextual this is, but like if we want to meet our aims of social justice, like like it's the simple the simple fix um, is is part of it maybe maybe there's a way in which you can integrate this VR stuff, but it's like there's if anything I've just learned that it's like you've got to, it's so much more complicated and you have to move so much more slowly and you need to have so much more resources and efforts and kind of really complicated. Um, into interdisciplinary and diverse teams to even get to the point where you can start addressing any of these. Fantastic. I, so, Tina, I really appreciate how you sort of framed, you know, this conversation we've been having in terms of building for versus building with. Um, and I think, so, if it's okay, we might shift to some questions from the audience because we have tons of excellent questions. And I think this is a nice segue into one that we received. Um, so there's this question of incorporating more people into the design process, the development process of AI systems. Uh, but there's also this question of what do we do then for other designers and developers? What kinds of education um, should there be in terms of improving the work that maybe non-diverse or people who don't occupy a marginalized uh, group? What sort of work should they be doing to improve their efforts uh, in the design and development of AI systems? And this is an open question, so any of you are free to jump in. Oh. No, 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 please. <laughs> <laughs> Too um, polite. <laughs> yeah, so, so I actually think about one of the hardest and often least discussed issues here by analogy to uh, Chinese landscape painting, funnily enough. So if you look at Chinese landscapes, there's very little black and there's a ton of white, right? They have these kind of mountains and clouds and things like that. And you can tell a true master not by how they draw the black part, but actually how they use the white. And I think this is something that's actually really overlooked in how we curate data sets and think about algorithmic bias and, and the issues of DEI, right? Because often we look at how bias is encoded directly by how things are associated, right? So, you know, um, uh, certain uh, uh, keywords about African Americans are associated with uh, criminal traits or something, and that's how the, the bias gets encoded. But actually what's really interesting and is overlooked is how things that are not spoken can encode bias, right? So a famous example that's often used is how, um, you, you know, if you, if you Google doctor, it's photos of all white men, right? And that's because the word woman has not been encoded to be tagged alongside doctor, right? And so I think what designers and ML people and people curating and auditing data sets need to think about is they need to think about how what's not in the data set can encode the bias, right? And, you know, this is particularly an issue because these algorithms are being developed and then deployed in increasingly globalized contexts, right? So if your training data is off of almost exclusively global north, weird populations, right? Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic. Um, then when these algorithms get deployed in other contexts, it doesn't really work or it encodes a certain kind of bias. And this was kind of like with the ambient example. Uh, it, it just certainly relates to the ambient example that Marion was talking about. So we basically need to become like landscape painters. We need to become masters of using the white instead of just focusing on the black. That's terrible that it came out as white and black, but I think you, you got my, you got my meaning. Um, um, I was just going to say, 
going to jump in to say that. So one of the projects that I'm working on is thinking about what is that And one of the things that I, I've settled on is that is, I think like, I was saying, like, we need to shift away from thinking that we can make people expert on the experiences of being marginalized and being oppressed. Um, and I feel like so much of our DEI education tends to lean in that way of like we can just teach people about all the myriad ways of like how awful it is to walk through the world when you're when you're marginalized or oppressed. And for me, it's more about like can we make folks more literate? Can we make them able to engage in the conversation to listen to the people who are actually expert, which are the folks who are living this day to day, um, and then be able to understand what's being told to them? Um, because I think that position someone to be a lot more open to not think of themselves as the one who's going to solve the problem or figure it out, but to understand that they are not, but have the tools in place to understand the information that's being given to them. Um, and so in sort of the push that we have in terms of like how do you build inclusive AI, it's not about um, making the expert team, it's about having everyone have the same kind of language be able to talk about social equity, right? When you have community advocates coming to you and telling you about a problem, don't misinterpret what they're saying, but actually hear, hear what they're telling you. Um, and be able to have that conversation ongoing. And so I really focus on this idea of like equity literacy for our tech teams, as opposed to sort of an expertise on DEI. Um, and that, again, when the ethicist comes into the room and they say, hey, maybe don't do this, they can actually hear that and they can recognize the gravity of the situation as to why they need to stop or why they need to slow down. Because I think, again, what we've heard from um, ethics uh, team members from within development teams is that, like, yeah, I'm here, but I don't have a lot of authority to actually make the shift that I want to change. Like, we're, you know, we're seeing that exit is happening because folks are not getting um, that ability to stop a project. And so the question becomes, like, okay, how can we make sure the teams actually hear them? And so I think the move towards literacy, giving them a baseline language to understand what we mean by social inequality and social justice from the social sciences perspective, from an ethics um, perspective, um, is really, I think, more of the move <laughs> um, than sort of guiding us away from that and trying to do these, you know, um, the exercises, which only, goes, again, go so far. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really appreciate it. I imagine there's some deep agreement with uh, Eric with what you were saying, Tina, in terms of not needing to make people experts of some sort of embodied experience, right? But the way you put it in terms of building some kind of equity literacy. Because I know I hear often from students who start getting really interested in tech ethics, which, yay, awesome. Uh, but one concern they bring up is like, okay, well, when I start my internship or when I start my career, it's great to know these things, but how do I advocate for them? How do I actually make changes if I'm not the person in a position of power? And so building those kinds of skills that just make them better team members, uh, people that are able to hear the sort of concerns that are being raised and not have to be the expert who has the onus on them to try and solve all of these problems. I think it's a really, really valuable and sort of nuanced way of putting, putting the goal. Marilyn, are you wanting to jump in here? Say, I was going to say, um, in response to this, you used a, a word, Susan, that also relates a little bit to the first panel on character this morning, which I find really helpful, which is this idea of like skills. And maybe I'd be really interested to hear what Eric whether this makes sense on Eric's talk, but I think that like the idea of teaching, teaching and developing ethics as a skill with like opportunities to practice those skills, I think it kind of sits a little bit with what Tina was saying. I find that really helpful for working with students. Like I teach a, a class of, over the summer that's called like teaching, you know, it's ethics as a skill, it's experiential ethics, and um, and but that's more for academic students rather than in a workplace. But I think it's a really helpful notion and one of the another kind of set of concrete tools is in this book the, the data feminism book um there are different kinds of concrete like concrete skill-based development exercises and one of them that i really love to do with my students and that maybe could work if you would know more in the workplace is building these so-called data biographies so it's like when you have this is more for kind of interrogating your data and less for kind of the team building. I guess these are two different dimensions of kind of social justice DEI, but if you have like a data set and you're using it to train a model or to do whatever it is you're doing, just that the everyone or everyone like knows, or many people know, or it's uh, that like this idea that data, you know, there's um, raw data is an oxymoron. That's the name of one of my favorite edited volumes. Um, that data always has a history. It comes from many, many decisions and choice, choice points influenced by values were made to get to that data set. 
And so one thing that, you could, that I have my students do is to try and build a, a data biography, to write a data biography. You ask a series of questions like, where did the data come from? Who collected it? Why did they collect it? Where was it stored? There's like, the, the book has like a, a kind of like worksheet of these different questions. And sometimes you can't always answer the questions, but sometimes you can kind of like have the students be like an investigative reporter and go back and be like, oh, this came, you know, from here, and this, it was, who was the funder for this? And, and then just the act and the practice of doing that, I think, gives, or hopefully, um, gives kind of like a new kind of skill-based capacity to when they encounter data sets in the future, maybe in their internships or wherever, and come into having more power, that they have this kind of built-in kind of, oh, I, I look and I see, this is a different type of virtual reality. Maybe then they're like, when they see data, they're actually seeing it, through different eyes, hopefully, when they have the skill. But this is like a, just something I'm thinking about and working towards. Yeah. Awesome. I, I'll invite Eric to see if he wants to jump in on this before we maybe pick up this point about data sets. Yeah, thanks, Susan. I, I think, you know, one of, one of the temptations of turning to something like algorithmic solutions or algorithmic kinds of solutions to, to certain kinds of issues like this is, is scale, right? I mean, scale is really, really hard. Uh, and this makes it very easy, right? It's very easy to create a simulation and make it available to anyone to download for whatever reason. Um, and it and it has the promise of making it seem like you can get results quite easily and cheaply. But what we're hearing on the panel, and I I agree, right? And and I really like so I you know I I, I tend to I tend to prioritize a kind of virtue approach as well. But um, I think you know we we we've got to teach this as a skill based activity. And and Susan. I mean, we, we both teach at Santa Clara, so this might, uh, but I doubt that this is due to that. I get the same question from students, right? Which is like, hey, I had this internship, but nobody wants to talk about ethics. And often, you know, part of what has to be done, and this is, I think, unfortunate, and it's a structural issue, is you've kind of, you kind of have to prove that you understand the tech, the, the development or technological side to earn the respect of the development team. But there isn't the there isn't the, the the same expectation on the on the normative side, right? That that like they have to understand ethics better or more more seriously. That's that's another kind of structural issue that I think we we need to get better at adopting our culture in these teams, so that we cross train better on both on both sides. I think. Yes, a culture shift into equity literacy. <laughs> I think it maybe sums up what we've been talking about here. Um, I'd like to backtrack for a second and talk about data sets, and this maybe even goes as far back as Matthew when you were talking about over-reliance on quantitative data and then uh, the data feminism book sort of investigating data provenance and all of these questions. Um, as it connects to one of the questions from our audience, actually. So someone says that AI systems are historical artifacts built on past data, existing norms, fundamental code, et cetera. How do we overcome this legacy effect in the built systems, um, because we're literally starting from a blank slate, right? So I think this connects very nicely to this idea of we can't over rely too much on the quantitative data because there's already some biases built in, right? You, the last thing you want to do is just end up perpetu perpetuating a bias or some kind of inequality in an algorithmic system, especially because it can do things at scale. So there's a, a you know special concern there that if we get things wrong, uh, we can get things wrong in a really big way. Um, and so we can't always just trust the data that we do have, given that it has maybe uh, arose out of some problematic ways. Um, so I guess this is an open question, just to talk more about data and how you think about that and as it relates to your work. Oh, and it's an open question for anyone to jump in. I can, I've spoken. I'll say something short. I feel like I've spoken a lot, but this is really interesting. I mean. One, I think that I love that, to, you know, like thinking about AI systems and the data sets involved as historical artifacts and just, gen, you know, historical, social, cultural artifacts. I think that's crucial, and I think it's absolutely right to be asking quest to be, first of all, conceptualizing AI systems in that way as opposed to this kind of, like, purely technical, rather, you know, instead of these kind of socio-technical systems or historical artifacts. And I think... What I find um, another thing that's really helpful to keep in mind is, well, what is this solution? Like, that was kind of what this question was asking. What do we do, given that we know that they are historical artifacts? And I think the right, the, the way we don't want to go is to think, OK, so there's a lot of values built in. There's a lot of bias. You could call it you know, whatever it is. Um, 
So what we want to do is get rid of it. Like what we want is a bias-free or value-free data set. And I think that um, when you look at the fact that, you know, data sets and AI systems, there's like, they, you kind of think of how they're built as a as curation. Like you can't in, include all data because then it would just be like, I don't know if anyone's read that Borges map, Borges map of the world. Like you can't just have an exact representation of the world. It's a model, it's curated. And in doing so, you have to make choices. And you can look to kind of pragmatics, for example, like this one makes more sense, but often what makes more sense is relative to the particular context that you're in. So it's inevitable that it's going to, like the historical artifactualness is inescapable and so are the kind of values that determine it. And so if that's the case, um, there's one way of looking at it, which is like, oh, well, data sets are inevitably biased. So what, you know, do we just give up? Like there's all these quote unquote bias. Or if to realize that there's like, there's different types like, and so that's why I think, I don't want to keep telling into this, but this idea of like the data feminism is that instead of going for purely objective value free data, you know, what we want, like what is feminist data, like that's just as biased but in a different direction. If you admit that it's always like from, you know, the bottom down, biased and value laden, then the question becomes, well, which, one, which values do we want? And like, how do we, you know, if we're gonna, if they're gonna be historical artifacts, like which histories which context do we want to draw on? And that becomes a discussion of, I think, why the work, Tina's work is so crucial, because it's like, you know, we can't aim for neutrality. Instead, we have to aim for, you know, feminist anti-racist data. And it will always be value-laden in a way. Bias, some of the trick of bias is it has this negative connotation. Um, but like, there will always be context. And so then it's up to us to, to craft and curate in a very normative value-laden way our data sets and to do it in a way that doesn't perpetuate injustice. So I think uh, there's three things that I've been thinking about uh, in answer to this question and, and I'm working on. This actually connects really well with a lot of the things Marion's been saying. The first is just kind of the obvious one, which is to do uh, model parts, which is kind of like the data biographies that Marion was talking about. And we actually had the good fortune in sight to have Margaret Mitchell come and talk to us, and she was one of the kind of pioneers of this. But it's basically like how you have nutrition labels on the side of food boxes, so you know like what you're putting into your body, kind of serving size, how it's intended to be used, things like that. Model cards basically give an accessible description of like what the issues are for the model, the kind of data it's trained on, so the kind of context it should be rolled out in, and so on. The problem is that as we know from psychology, human beings are really bad at having that knowledge kind of penetrate to other areas of their like belief structure. So just because you understand that there are certain constraints and limitations of a data set doesn't mean you're gonna actually use that data set responsibly. So another thing I've been working on is um, kind of making these calls for synthetic data. So the idea that you can correct for issues in your data set by either changing some of the numbers or the parameters or actually just artificially generating behaviors or data points like in the data. And that actually ties back into some of these conversations about virtue, right? Because in the virtue theoretic tradition, we think that the way you become virtuous is by learning from exemplars. And there's been a lot of work around the fact that, you know, there might not actually be that many good unproblematic exemplars, right? I mean, the fact that Linda Zadetsky based almost her entire theory on this exemplarism strand on Jean Vanier, who just came out, like did all these horrific things to the nuns under his care. It illustrates it's very difficult to find exemplars, um, just like it's very difficult to find the right data. And so uh, what virtue theorists have increasingly done is turn to fiction, right? Because we can have these kind of like asymptotic uh, 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 constructs of like what the ideal exemplar can look like, right? And, and I think synthetic data can serve that kind of purpose. The third thing I'll mention is that I think particularly where algorithms are used as moral decision aids, and there's a temptation to kind of, because of automation bias, overly rely on them, we need to actually introduce a pretty significant amount of noise, right? So how do we get out of people uh, falling asleep at the wheel in their driverless cars and having cars crash? Introduce noise, right? Make the automatic braking not come on periodically, right? Just to keep people on their toes, right? Um, uh, and similarly with parole or sentencing, I think it should give a kind of like heuristic range, maybe along a normal curve that kind of gets you close to maybe how many years you should sentence them, but it's within a range of kind of error. I mean, I'll give a kind of trivial example just to close so that you under like, understand what I'm getting at, right? Which is like watches, right? 
So there's there's certain problems with the watch inherent to the mechanism, right? There, there's machine error in that you gain or lose maybe like a couple seconds every day. There's also user error, right? You look at it, you uh, you see the wrong time, or you know if you're like me, you're just terrible at planning. So what my solution is is to introduce noise. I have this watch that gains or loses like a minute every day because it's like you know on, on the cheaper end of mechanisms, and I'm not late for things anymore because. Any given time, I, 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 I am conscious of the machine error, right? The plus or minus a minute every day. And I'm also more conscious of the user error, right? The fact that I'm always running late for things. And so by introducing extra noise, I don't have an over-reliance on my watch. But it's still within a range that, like, I generally have a sense of what's going on, right? Like, I don't think it's 7 in the morning, but I have no idea how much time is left on this panel. I have a kind of general sense, but like not a very exact one, right? So I think introducing noise is also going to help us get out of this kind of automation bias where we overly rely on algorithms that kind of have these bad effects uh, for DEI stuff. Yeah. Um, I just want to pick up on a point that Marion was making about sort of the inherent bias that just exists across all data sets. Um, I'm a little bit more skeptical of synthetic data, but that is something we can talk about later. <laughs> Same. And, and you know, the, the question after you called it historical artifacts, but we have to remember they're actually, they're human-made historical artifacts. Um, and I think remembering that we are the ones still creating, we're the ones still interpreting how we see the world, how we end up deciding what to count, how to count it, what to look for, um, is really important. Um, I started actually like, training more quantitatively in my field. And I remember sort of as being a you know, junior research analyst, like my job was to understand the data set. Like I went through all the documentation, all the white papers to figure out like how did they ask this question? How could this question have been interpreted differently by different participants? How do I have to understand um, what may seem like outliers in the data set? And how confident am I that they're actually outliers? Was it someone miskeyed it when they're um, you know, releasing the data set? Did I do something wrong? Um, and so I had to have that understanding, um, and like I think what got drilled into me was it's a number, but you have to interpret it. This is where all the additional training you get in understanding the context and the structure, all the historical um, you know literature reviews that we do, the historical context like understandings that we gain is so that we can actually interpret what the numbers are trying to tell us or signify to us, and again we can decide. Is this sort of what we expected? Did we do something wrong in the analysis? Is it moving in the right direction? And so for me, it's again, it's not about trying to find the perfect data set or trying to build those perfect data sets. It's that we need to be trained better to understand what the data set actually is telling us um, and all the different ways in which it can be interpreted um, and then how we can interpret the outcomes of it to actually then draw the conclusions. And I, and I feel like we often forget that we are the human in the loop in this process, and we are incredibly crucial um, for these kinds of studies. And so, and I think that's something that right now our AI and machine learning can't do. It doesn't know how to interpret based on situational um, you know, inputs. And so, it is really important for us to remember. Awesome. Um, do we have about 10 minutes left? Give or take? Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, so I want to squeeze in one more question. So we were just talking about data sets, but maybe let's zoom out for a second and just talk about the AI as a system. Uh, one question we received from the audience was talking about when we think about measuring the harms of a certain system in terms of maybe biased outputs that we're receiving, how do we determine how much we can accept? Uh, one thing that Marion spoke pretty passionately about was like this idea that, well, we're not going to have bias-free data sets. We're not going to have entirely neutral data sets, so let's just give up on that sort of idea. Uh, but then it does raise this question, especially when we're thinking about an entire system with potentially biased outputs. Where do we draw the line between what's considered an acceptable risk or harm um, and what would be unacceptable? And maybe even Tina, you could speak to kind of how some of those conversations or decision-making processes might, like happen in practice. But it's, again, an open question, so anyone is, is welcome to jump in. Just say really quickly, like I think what's kept coming up in this conversation, just to put a name to it, is there's a difference between outputs and outcomes. So I think if you zoom out and you look at the whole system, not just how the algorithm's working, but how humans are using it, um, you can evaluate the outcomes rather than the outputs, right? So it might be that we actually want a super biased criminal 
a sentencing algorithm, right? That's gonna like throw black people in jail for like 30 years, of, uh, you know, for like a really small charge. Because maybe then the human judge looks at that and says, oh wow, okay, so we have all these like historical biases and things like being encoded into this algorithmic output and now I need to be more careful, right? Um, and so it could be that, um, you know, that's a case where the output is really biased, but the outcome might actually be a, a salutary one in that it kind of like wakes people up to these forms of bias, right? And I think the, the, the other reason why this is important is because it can work in the converse too, right? Like there's a lot of companies who are just focused on fairness in the outputs, right? So you, you, you could have a criminal sentencing algorithm that's like completely fair based off of like what you did and there's a lot of parity, but that may not be the outcome that the people who are being sentenced want, right? They might want to be sentenced by a human being because they see that as, you know, an important higher order relational good, uh, even if there's like some unfairness, quote unquote, there, right? Like they, that, they may not want to be sentenced by an algorithm or, um, yeah, so, so uh, all that to say, yeah, I think if we draw this distinction between output and outcomes, zoom out, look at the overall system, it may be that biased algorithms can actually be helpful. And it may actually be that perfectly fair algorithms are unwanted. So I, I can't hear super well, but but if, if I'm being asked to, to say something, I think um, I, I, I'm going to ag agree mostly with what you were saying, Matthew, um, except to say to zoom out even larger, right, is, is, is the initial question of what, what does success look like here, right? I mean, um, you, you, you get this output from, let's say, a sentencing algorithm. What, what is it that we want it to do, I think, is the question that I heard you asking, right? I mean, you can train it to give you any answer you want, but ultimately, this is a question about, I think, larger socio-political moral goals. And you, it's hard to assess algorithmic output without first at least having some kind of consensus on what it is we want them to do. And what I've been hearing on this panel a lot, which I think is also something I agree with, right, is like to answer that question, we need to expand the people who are contributing to the answer. And how we do that is another complicated socio-political moral question, right? How, how is it that we change and restructure education or hiring practices so that when we develop these algorithms, we can have a better sense of what we mean by, is this the right output? Is there a problem with the output here or not? Um, and, and, and none of this, I think, is going to be something that we can very easily turn to a technological solution for it. It's ultimately the hard work of ethics, I think. One, um, one again, to this idea of like the zooming out, I think it's, it's really helpful. I mean, it made me think of like, what, like, this is a deep, like, if the question is, well, what kind of quote unquote bias, like you could call it value, or like what, what do we want to encode? What, what is acceptable and unacceptable within our um, systems, including the data, but the systems overall, um, then it's, this is a really deep question about like, what world do we want to create? And, um, and I think that um, like speaking again, I think Matt mentioned kind of fiction at one point, and then um, there's this idea of like, you know, could the VR world be part of this? Maybe not in this exact, or definitely not in this, ex only in this exact way that um, Eric talked about, but I, um, one, another thing I, I like to teach in teaching ethics of technology um, is to, in my classes, is to kind of assign and, and get students to kind of engage in like science fiction as a tool for like thinking about different futures. And this was inspired by um, uh, um, a number of black feminist scholars who, who use this term like speculative fiction, this idea that like maybe we can use our like joint shared imaginaries to kind of think about what our futures could look like and use that as part of a process for trying to determine, okay, well, what, what, where are we moving? In this, in this world where we're building technologies where we're like kind of on the edge of where we can imagine where they're gonna go, like what resources, like collective narrative, imaginative resources do we have and how can we set up communities that do that to kind of try and answer this, the deep question at the bottom of all of this, which is that if we give up on this, this notion of pure, God, you know, neutrality, objectivity understood in this way, if we realize that they, or creating things made by humans and then historical artifacts, then we, we have to have means of creating these kind of equitable, kind of social justice-based um, 
visions of, of what our future and you know and our present wants needs to be and like maybe that's like at the core of like the D like when I see the DEI stuff and it's like okay well we need people like when you look at the executives on tech companies there's huge problems and yes but like deeply underneath that it's like to solve these problems isn't just adding people but it's like adding ways to imagine new futures together which is a very cool task but I think that there are people out there um, like scholars and activists out there who are, who are doing this work that we can bring in and look to. Um, I was just going to add that I think we have such a strong desire just to get a checklist or a manual on how to do this and not, you know, and, and be good people, like a manual on how to be good people and build good things. Um, and that's really enticing, but I think what, you know, everyone has been saying is that this notion of good, um, the notion of ethical is actually highly context specific. What works in one situation actually does not hold true for another one. And so what we always encourage our partners to think about is like, don't think about the actual like things that you need to check off, but think about the questions that you need to be asking yourself and the, and the team to determine that for yourself. But also then like, how are you making that public? How are you sharing that out so that you can then be held accountable to it? Um, like I think there's an element of like my American upbringing and like education where I really do believe in checks and balances that like it's not fully and entirely on either the public and the civil society advocates to hold everyone accountable and it's not solely on companies or the ones building the technology to do it perfectly every time like it has to be a dynamic between all of us and the regulators um, coming together to figure out how to keep nudging us in the right direction and how to deal with the situations that do come up that we didn't want um, and so our thing is you know, make sure those conversations are happening very early. Like they need to be as core a part of the work plan for developing new technology as it is in terms of determining what the problem is that you want to solve, the kind of data sets that you want to use. Like you have to have your own ethics um, sort of strategy and plan and inclusion plan in place before you actually get the work going and then continuously update it as you get more input and as you get more information. Um, and in addition to that, like I said, that needs to be made clear to everybody else so that they can also help you figure out, are you hitting those goals and those objectives or are you not? Are you doing something completely horrific that actually 99% of the population says that this is a really bad idea? We won't know that unless you actually tell us, right, as a developer. Um, and so having that degree of transparency is really necessary and having that information accessible by the public is really necessary. Um, and I just want to call it, like, I think Hugging Face is one of those um, companies like AI companies that's like really trying to do this like they published a blog recently about how they as a team are talking about their ethics and how they're making it a cornerstone of all of their projects and again one of the big things that they did was was a team wide and it was early and I think that's a really great example of where we can get started on this process of figuring out um, getting to all the different kinds of good that can exist. Wonderful. Well, I think we are at time, and that means it's lunch. So I want to thank all of our panelists for such a wide-reaching and important conversation.